everybody. This is Wayne. And Stephen. And Michael. And that's Michael in the background. He's doing the engineering for us today. And we are the Flaming Lips. And first off, we want to say thanks to everyone who has congregated here today to do this uh, listening to our new record thing. Yep. What we're going to be doing is we're going to be talking about our new record. It's called Yoshimi Battles the Pink Robots. That's right. Um, hopefully, we'll, uh, for you folks, we can highlight some of the more interesting and colorful aspects of uh, you know, the writing of the songs, the recording of the sounds. Yeah, some things there's otherwise you could just never know. And maybe even illuminating some of the deeper meaning, if there is any, to be uh, found in any of these songs or anything like that. So, um, wow. <laughs> So if you, that sounds like a good time. I hope it does to you. So uh, sit back, and um, I hope this is entertaining, and we'll be guiding you through it sort of song by song, talking about it. Here we go. Thanks. This is a perfect example of me being Wayne, sitting at the uh, four track, writing a uh, simple uh, chord progression uh, type song, you know, with a simple melody, and uh, handing it over, so to speak, to the, uh, you know, what production can come from it with Steven and, and Michael and Dave Fridman. Well, you've got a, you know, you've got a classic example of a, it's kind of a, Kind of like the old storytelling fable songs where you, you have a story to tell and there's sort of a lesson to be learned. and So the song had that appeal anyway. Even if you were just going to play it on acoustic guitar, it's, it's great in that sort of way. And then we ran into the trouble almost immediately with... Um, Dave Fridman recognized, recognized it first as being reminiscent of the Cat Stevens song, uh, Father and Son, which uh, with a little manipulating, we changed it, I think, legally that it doesn't resemble him enough that he can come and... And, and torture us later, but um, exactly. So yeah. you know, you take you take that kind of song, which is just a catchy melodic song anyway. And then the idea was like, hey, let's let's see if we can come up with some uh, wicked beats to put underneath that, and some some more contemporary sounds to mix up with the classic acoustic singer songwriter. And now we started off as in a different key, like a lower key, and it was a lot slower. And with some actually, it wasn't the same key as the Cat Stevens song. I think. Well, I think I maybe I changed it even before I got there into a different key, but it was definitely slower. And the, uh, with Dave Fridman's insistence, we, uh, even against our, our wishes, we made it faster. And I think it, it really turned out a lot better because, because we made it faster. And um, I think when I was doing the original four track, it was on one of these tapes that I'd used for the um, boombox experiment. And as I got through with the third or fourth take of my own uh, rehearsing of the melodies and things like that, this little uh, thing on there said, the test is over now, or the test begins now. And I just thought, wow, that, that's a bizarre little element to put in there. So you'll hear at the very beginning of the song this thing that says, the test begins now, and that's just a happy accident of... Which actually sounds a little bit like James Earl Jones, we were thinking. Well, we were hoping to get James Earl Jones. Yeah, because I, I actually yeah. have met this guy. This is kind of a sidebar of a story, but a friend of mine up in New York... Uh, his fiance's family are best friends with the James Earl Jones family, so he was going to try to maybe contact them and see if uh, if he come on, you know, come down and do a voiceover, but uh, didn't happen. But it uh, kind of sounds like James Earl Jones. Anyway. So that's my best James Earl Jones. Yeah, uh, the test begins now, sort of thing. So anyway, so at the very beginning of the real track, which we'll we'll play next, you'll hear this this uh, James Earl Jones ish. Announcement that happens at the beginning of the song. The crowd applause. And yeah, yeah, and it, it implies some, some grand, uh, some battle, some some confrontation, something, and um, and then again at the end we we leave with another uh, strange sort of test thing. And so um, here we go. Here's here's the final production thing of uh, which is the first song on the record. It goes like this. If you were actually listening to the record, you'd, you'd see that these two songs, the first one and this one you're getting ready to hear, would have run together. But we're kind of interrupting the sequence here to kind of explain a little bit about uh, the workings of this song. This song is uh, typical of the other kind of song that we usually uh, 
you know, will work. We got the, the kind where I'm sitting at the four track, you know, uh, uh, singing and, and strumming some simple chords. And this song is, is, is sort of represents what a lot of the way Stephen's songs arrive is you have a, a chord structure and a melody and everything is really sort of comes intact. And I'm mostly just a, a, applying sort of an, putting an identity and in in some, the, the identity of, of, of what I'm going to sing about will dictate uh you know kind of what the sounds and the production maybe are going to be after that and uh this song uh starts off with it uh, sort of in the typical uh what would you call it steven and eric carmen kind of 70s uh dramatic kind of power ballad sort of thing you know, like eric carmen all by myself or something like that uh, uh, even lionel richie e- even lionel richie i remember us talking that it, it sort of reminded us of lionel richie in in this in, in this initial uh, uh way that you presented the song and again, I think uh, Dave Fridman's insistence on no, don't do a slow ballad, make it faster. Even, even I think this one not so much against our wishes. We were sort of like, yeah, we agree. We we do a lot of slow. We kind of had like a sort of a halftime feel to it. I remember we went to the grocery store for about an hour, and we came back, and and uh, Michael and Dave had changed the tempo like ten beats and put like this sort of, sort of super electronic. Uh, kind of beat on top of it so right it kind of changed the whole feel there you go really. and then you you played that crazy bass and everybody seemed happy and that was really as far as we needed to to go with it and then it just sort of became this this uh strange i still don't know what it is it's it i, I still feel like it's a lionel richie song about a, a robot with a bunch of synthesizers on top of it maybe wow <laughs> <laughs> so anyway uh it, this song uh, in the in the story that's being told about this Yoshimi battling the pink robots uh, song story. This is the story about the robot. The robot is a 3021 series, and this robot has uh, these sort of uh, super evolved uh, uh, makers who uh, who have, have, have designed this robot so that it has is capable of feeling emotions. This is some kind of futuristic machine, and this, this robot is able to feel emotions and uh, it sees the Yoshimi woman that um, it's supposed to battle with the very next day, and it has fallen in love with Yoshimi. And so, uh, this is a little story about the robot having feelings for Yoshimi. And at the very end of it, it does a little, a little sad kind of reprise, a little bit of the melody. And this is yeah, we, we changed the key to a higher key, and the uh, the fleshed out arrangement is more of an orchestral kind of feel. So. A little more, it's even a little more somber in some way. Yeah, so when you get to the end of the song, after the sort of disco romp that the rest of it is, you, you'll see the, the sad, the sad parts. And this is supposed to represent the, the robot sort of concluding that he's going he's gonna to kill himself. He's going to commit suicide as opposed to harming his beloved Yoshimi that he's going to have to fight with. Once again, wow. There you go. And this is a song, it's called One More Robot. It goes like this. This is uh, track three on the record. If you're listening, this is called Yoshimi Battles the Pink Robots, part one. Uh, this one's kind of interesting. Um, what you're hearing now is a lot of, um, you know, drum machines and sort of um, computer programmed sounds. And the way this song happened was originally, I just had a little simple chord progression um, and, a, and a melody that was kind of reminiscent of a, a Sade song we liked. And so that sort of grabbed our attention at first, and we were playing around with that. But, uh, you know, usually when I come up with something, I don't really have any subject matter in mind. Didn't have any lyrical ideas, so gave a little tape of it to Wayne. He seemed to like it. And, um, but this one is, is, is not a typical kind of way that we work, because usually I've got something and you kind of enhance it, or you've got something and I kind of enhance it, and this is kind of like you had some little bit, and then I had a little bit to it, and then you had some bits, and it just kind of built. So people think it would be one of these silly little songs that I would write, but really it's kind of it's really a song that you wrote, you know? But really the, the, the question that everyone seems to ask is, where did you come up with, hey, Wayne, where did you come up with the Yoshimi Battles the Pink Robot? And that's where I say uh, I was listening to your melody, and I took... Some acid, 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 acid. Really? Yeah. I took eight hits. Hits. Is that a lot? Hits. 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 Eight hits at once. Hits. Hits. Yeah. Hits. 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 That's a lot. 
Anyway, but it seemed to work Let's just out. Shift gears here and go back to the. No, but that that was the that's that thing where you, you know you have you have nice melody and some good chords. We even had some ideas for beats, and then but the lyrical content. What's that going to be? I guess in my mind, I thought of some melancholy. You know, I always think of the obvious love song sort of thing. But well, then, I've been working on trying to come up with a title for what now is is really the Yoshimi Battles the Pink Robots Part Two. And once I came up with this this intriguing title, the Yoshimi Battles the Pink Robots. I was sitting there with your melody running through my head, and then suddenly I was singing, Oh, Yoshimi, they don't believe me. And I don't know if that's the right spot where the music is. Kind of close. Yeah, okay. And it, so it goes something like that. And um, the Yoshimi character, there'll be some debate about whether this is meant to be the woman from the boredoms or not, and, and we'll try to clear that up as this as this little the part of the thing is, is rambling on. Yoshimi from the boredoms does indeed play on, I believe, three of these songs. She was touring around America right as we began recording uh, stuff that was ended up being on this record and the Christmas on Mars. This is like March of 2001. It, exactly. And we went down to Austin, Texas and recorded it with her really just one afternoon, going through maybe three or four different things with her down there. And she played some trumpet and did a lot of screaming. And she's a wonderful musician who does all kinds of things, plays drums, guitars, horns, sings. She's, she's just one of these strange, uh, unique musicians. And um, we were intrigued by even uh, the first time that we met her when she was playing with the Boredoms uh, during the 1994 Lollapalooza tour that we were on as well. And uh, they played early in the day and we saw them play virtually every day. And, 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 and Just great to watch her play. I mean, she does so many things well. And yet we, we say that we're friends with, them, but with her and with all of them uh, to a certain extent, but they speak no English, really, in a way, and, and we uh, speak absolutely no Japanese, none. So uh, there is always a little bit of difficultness in knowing exactly what's being communicated from one to the other. But I think, to as much as we could understand, we, we played her this music that was unfinished at the time, and she sang and did whatever she wanted on the tracks, which was, to, to our ears, was all wonderful. And we took it back up to the studio, and we've manipulated it four or five different times in different ways, and, and, and would overdub her on top of herself and all that sort of stuff. So there's a, for the Yoshimi Battles, the Pink Robots Part 2, which we'll just play the two together. She made this incredible sound that, to, to me today, is still sounds somewhere in between um, a woman that's having sex or a woman who's getting the, the living shit beat out of her. I can't decide. <laughs> right, you'll hear that in, in the part two, which is sort of, uh, you know, it's almost like if you use your imagination too much, it's almost like she's battling the robots as you're hearing that exactly. song go by. Exactly, I think if you, if you know that going into it, that there, it has that sound. And so so how, about, how about we hear both those together? We'll Here hear, we go. Yeah, part one and part two. All right. <laughs> A strange uh, title. I, I think it makes it more interesting. It's called uh, "The Morning of the Magicians," and I've, I've, it's been brought to my attention as a popular uh, book, uh, maybe about the Aleister Crowley uh, crowd. That I knew it was a title to a book. I didn't actually know what it was about, but I was just recently in Germany, and uh, several German uh, journalists pointed out that it's a very popular book in Germany. Um, that been said, um, even if I knew that, I, I probably still would have liked to have titled it the same thing. It reminds thing. you a lot of things, you know, the fantastical, the... Exactly. I yeah. even really, you know, thought of uh, The Magician's Birthday, the Uriah Heap uh, record, you know. Of course, um, yeah. Maybe yeah. that's going too far, but you yeah. know, it's all, just, yeah. it kind of gives it an interesting twist and makes you wonder, what that, what is that song about? Yeah. Okay. No, I, I'm with you, because uh, otherwise it's such a vague uh, sentiment that's going on, it, could, it really could be about anything. So I, I, it's a, another, it's just a, one of these songs where we connect bits that really aren't related at all, and you end up with this thing that you really don't know if it works at all. Uh, this, there's a little part uh, where I'm singing, which really all came about, we were kind of simply just sitting on the four track and hoping that some great arrangement could be built around it. And then about a month later, coming up with the weird uh, synthesizer beat part at the beginning, and then Stephen uh, and me got together and I said, hey, what do you think of these two bits? And then in typical fashion, he does this weird uh, shifting of the keys from one key to the next little segue uh, and sort of connects them all. 
And um, I think when we first did this song, we weren't sure if we liked it or if we thought it was a mess or if any of it worked. But when we brought it out closer to the end of the record, we brought it back out and for some reason we thought, wow, that, that really has kind of a... Those, throwing those three different moods together at different times, it really seemed to have a uh, something new. Like we would have never arrived at thinking that those should work and then that's just the, the surprise element of... of, of, of putting something away for a while and hearing it again fresh going wow that, that seems to work so hopefully that works for you as well and we'll play the real version now i know you've heard this a couple of times now and so here it goes the morning of the magicians <laughs> All right. So uh, what you're hearing now, it's actually, uh, this is one of my favorite tracks on the record, but this is actually an early demo of Ego Tripping at the Gates of Hell. Interesting title there. Uh, this is a sort of a perfect example of how a song can evolve from its earliest incarnation in the, in the demo form to what it becomes on the final recording. Um, Wayne had borrowed a Roland monophonic synthesizer from a friend of ours, and he was kind of uh, interested in experimenting around with its various uh, the sounds and effects and tones of this particular keyboard. So he put that onto a little tape, and then at the same time he was messing around with some of the cooler drum loops that were available on another keyboard that we have. So he played this thing for us, and I remember that I immediately was drawn to the actual rhythm of the bass line and kind of the whimsical nature of the sound effects and all that sort of stuff that was happening. So when you have this type of demo already, you end up writing a song to the sounds. That is to say, instead of writing a song on piano or guitar, like we were saying earlier, and then piecing together the arrangement from there, you work the other way. You try to build chord progressions and melodies into something that's already a cool beat and cool sounding. So the next thing we did was put a descending sort of um, keyboard string line to sit on top of the whole thing. And then you've got a, a nice little soundscape and a little rhythm to listen to for a couple of minutes. So the next thing would have been, we were trying to find chords that would fit with the repeating bass line. We tried a few things and it didn't take too much before we got something cool on that. So once we sorted that out, we put a horn line to act as kind of the counterpoint to the string line. And then that actually became the basis for the vocal melody. It was sort of almost like a guide track for the vocal melody. And in many cases, once you start putting words to melodies and trying to fit in different syllables with the melody itself, it becomes a lot more memorable. And this isn't always the case, but certainly once Wayne came up with the I was waiting on a moment and all that stuff, those lyrics and all that, the whole song instantly appealed to me even more. So we took that up to the studio, and in the last stages of actually recording it, Dave Fridman, our co-conspirator in all of this stuff, suggested that we A, shorten the song, and B, make something new happen toward the end of the song to keep the listener interested. And this to me seemed like a perfect opportunity to do what we call a relative minor key change. And before I start discussing music theory, I'll just explain that with a relative minor key change, you can keep your actual vocal melody exactly the same, but you can change the chords beneath to a minor key, and that gives the whole song a more, kind of a melancholy tinge. So it's an interesting way to create a slight shift in the mood of a tune. So it was then we decided to just let the song fade out once it went to the minor key, and that fit perfectly with the sentiment of the lyrics. But the moment never came, but the moment never came. And he sort of repeats that at the end as it fades out. And there you go. So uh, what you'll hear now is actually the real version of Ego Trippin' at the Gates of Hell off the record. So there you go. Let me just uh, say that the me saying I took eight hits of acid earlier—that's that's, that's a lie. I, I don't I don't like acid. I don't I don't want to take it. I've taken it a couple of times, and from my experience, it has caused nothing but diarrhea and brain damage. And I wouldn't I don't like to take it. I wouldn't take it. And if anybody thinks that it it, it uh, enhances uh, creativity. Um, Good luck, fellas, uh, with that sort of thinking. If it does for you, good deal. Anyway, so this song 
I don't know what to add to that, really. I'll just say, okay, wow, <laughs> right, this, let's shift gears here. This, this next song is not an LSD-inspired rave-up rocker that a lot of people have alluded to, even though it may sound like that. I didn't take any drugs while I, while I was uh, thinking about this song because I frankly don't take drugs. But anyway. Um, Were you thinking of anyone in particular when you wrote the lyrics? I was, but not in, not in, a, not in a specific way. The lyric of, of, of using hip, being hypnotized, meaning you've been tricked by someone, and just I like that idea from the uh, line from, what's the Christmas movie? It's a Wonderful Life, where he, you know, he sort of confronts the... The angel, where he says, "Well, you know, what are you doing to me? Have you hypnotized me? What are you, a hypnotist?" And I just thought, "Oh, that's a great, that's a great way of saying you've tricked me," you know. And um, but but this song is it was the first one we had recorded. Summertime. Uh, uh, you started on that like in the summer of two thousand. Summer of two thousand, when, and when we convened to to start recording what would end up being the Pink Robots, this was the first track that we that we put down, and it had. I think we probably remixed it. Five or six. 30. 30. There you go. 30 different. Well, a lot of we try different drum combinations. Different drum combinations, different levels of what the backing stuff would do guitars versus keyboards and just all that sort of junk. And I don't think any of it really was necessarily good or bad. I think we'd always walk away going, that's weird. And I, I think the song, even today, still retains a kind of weirdness that uh, it, it is uh, not necessarily that it's bad or good it just some of it is just strange and for that reason alone i, I think oh, you know that works for me it's sort of a bleak science fiction feel to it for me I don't, i'm not sure what that is but wow there you go <laughs> no drug damage song though for sure Okay, this uh, this was a song, first song that we recorded that ended up being the beginning of the post Soft Bulletin sessions. After that, we had gone up to Fredonia to record with Jonathan from Mercury Rev, who's a friend of ours. We've known him for a long time, and they were up there recording and had a day or two off or something. And we were trying to do a remix of Race for the Prize, and Jonathan said he'd like a crack at it, and we went up there um, with the intention of doing a remix, and if we had time to do one more song, and this was the song that we'd taken up with us, figuring if we had time after doing this remix with Jonathan that we would get to this one. And we'd recorded a lot of the tracks in a studio here in uh, Oklahoma City, that's where I'm talking to you from, Oklahoma City, it was a friend of ours, and we'd record a lot of the a lot of the tracks here and then took them up to, to Dave's studio later. Well, the remix with Jonathan, nothing ever really came of it. We ended up talking and more than we did working, which was what we were hoped would really happen. But we did end up doing a little bit on this song with Dave Fridman. And um, it became really the, 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 the guide in a lot of ways for what the mood perhaps of what we were going to do next would sort of would sort of emerge as it had sort of this sad acoustic feel to it with these sort of bizarre electronic drums maybe not not bizarre to at some people's standards but, but a little bit of our standards at the time anyway and I um, I came up with this song a friend of ours a Japan and another Japanese element here a Japanese friend girl that we knew uh, had suddenly become ill and died and um, we were on tour in America, somewhere on the West Coast, and her sisters, this girl who had died, her sisters, who don't speak English very well, were sending Michael some emails telling us that, this, that their sister had become ill and had died. But none of the emails were very clear because they didn't speak English very well or anything. So we had a couple of strange weeks there because uh, 
we had just seen this woman and she was fine. We'd spent a, a, quite a bit of time with her and we were really under the impression that she was fine. So it was quite strange, little by little, to, to have this reality that she was dead sort of seep in. So just, you know, uh, I came up with this song in a kind of way to speak to these sisters that we could, couldn't really, with any certainty, kind of communicate with of this, this kind of sadness of this thing that had happened with their sister. And in a way, it's, uh, you know, it's me saying, uh, you know, even though you're sad, um, in the same way that I was sad when, when, when my father died, that this idea of going outside and experiencing things and have experiences come into your mind, as opposed to sometimes when people are so sad and perhaps suicidal, it's things that are inside their mind just regenerating themselves, and these aren't real experiences. And the idea that you need to have experiences to start to mix in with your inner experiences is really what this, the sentiment of this song is, is look outside and you'll, you'll know it's summertime and these ideas of what summertime will mix in with this, this inner sadness that you have. And hopefully, I'm not saying that it'll, it'll, it'll make you feel genuinely better, but it'll mix in there hopefully enough to elevate you out of this despair or whatever it is that you could be feeling. And that's kind of what the hopeful nature of this song is. And I think with all the arrangement and everything, that sort of ends up going. You have this little bird chirping away. It feels like a springtime, like a summer day. And yet it's sad, it's still it's still an encouraging sort of song. So here it goes. Okay, so that, that's me at the beginning doing the. That is one, you. Two, three. Just so you know, I thought that was fun. That's you overdubbed about ten yeah, times. Ten yeah. Times yeah. Exactly. The guitar. And what usually happens is you go in there and you start off just singing in the parts you're supposed to sing, but little by little, since you're in there for so many hours at a time. The fidgety fellow. Yeah. Yeah. And like making up stupid er, jokes. Every time something. You, yeah. And so sounds. And so everything is, is just filled up with you. It backfired on me that time. Yeah. It's like, oh, let's use that one, two, three. Yeah. It was, well, it adds a lightness to what otherwise is a, is a, is a horribly Pretty bleak, bleak, grayish sort of song. Yeah. So anyway, so we were set to, we have these sessions with Dave Fridman that sometimes last 10 days, two weeks, something like that. And we sometimes have an agenda. We want to at least get started on a couple of different songs. And we had gone too long, I forget what the other songs were, we had gone too long on the two others that we were working on, and we had maybe one day to throw the beginning ideas of this song onto a tape, and then I'd, I'd go home for a month or so, and we'd, we'd all convene again and, and say, hey, what'd you think of that? So we threw together in one day um, just the real basic parts of this song with a couple of acoustic guitars. Got a drum loop, did a couple acoustic tracks. Exactly. You know, plenty, of, plenty of stuff, but for us, really, just the beginning. And... Um, Everybody around us is always curious about what we're doing, and so we just play them whatever we have in whatever state, whether it's finished or half finished or whatever. And everybody that we played it for just loved this song. And we were like, oh, but it's not finished, it's not finished. But for some reason, they already really loved it. And even though, and, and somewhere in there, uh, when people tell us stuff like that, we believed them. I and mean, we, we understood that there was a simpleness and just being able to hear the lyrics and all that sort of stuff was probably what was working for. Yeah, it really, really saved us from the struggle of the remixing and remixing until we got what we thought was the perfect version of the song and really it sort of stayed in that simpler form. Like exactly, because left to our own devices, we usually muck it up pretty badly, yeah. Yeah, and then we have to re regroup and just reshape the whole thing. But yeah, this sort of just, they that got us started on a good path and it sort of it stayed simple by our standards anyway, and, and, and that's what you have. And that's the, that's the first single on the new record. That's the one that... Uh, that's For some reason, everybody focused on this one, and, and who knows how that happens. And so that's the single that we're shooting videos for and all that sort of junk. There you have it. So uh, this next one, this is um, this one is called "All We Have Is Now," 
It's actually another one of my favorite tunes on the record. I guess it was one of the later ones we did. It was toward the end of the session for this record. I think the way this one came about was, um, as is usually the case when I go to Wayne's house, we'll be sitting around and he'll say, hey, have you got any new songs for me? What have you got? You got any new ideas? And this particular time, I think I'd pretty much ran out of everything that was any new idea for me. So I went back in my brain. I'd written a song in 11th grade that never saw the light of day. It was an interesting chord progression and some melody. And somehow I'd pick this weird sort of sci-fi organ sound on the keyboard and and Wayne, his, that piqued his interest right there. And uh, so I did a little tape of it. And somehow he'd come up with this story of a, a man who meets himself, but it's himself from the future, warning him that, hey, you know, things aren't going to work out so good. So try to make the most of it now, I guess, sort of sentiment. Something so, like that, yeah. Something like that. And, um, I wish I could do that. I wish I could meet myself. That, now that you should see. Yeah. yeah. And the super low, all we have is now, is Michael doing his weird um, sinister robotic voice. So... It's another one of my favorites. So, there you go. Tell them about the sound. Oh, the sound, the, the low... is actually a sample. I don't know if this is interesting to anyone else, but it's actually a sample of a soldering gun. Or the charger on a soldering gun. I'm not... The solder sucker, that's what Michael said. So, we'd sample that because it was actually in a distinct key. We sampled that, and that's the... Low synthy sound you hear. So, kind of a, another bleak sci-fi adventure, if you will. Uh, this last, uh, this is gonna be the last track on the record, and um, this one started its its. This one is uh, approaching Stephanus Mons by balloon. By balloon, interesting title. But then it has this other Marsian title called Utopia Planetia, and I think we originally were intending it to be part of the Christmas on Mars soundtrack, and little by little we kept playing around with it as 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 it was, was supposed to represent some sort of. A uh, virtual reality trip that uh, was was going to happen to the to the to my character. your character in the movie, but but it never really materialized to be that. And little by little, we kept liking it and kept liking the mood of uh, the strangeness. How it really didn't didn't really sound like anything else we'd ever done. And um, some people think it sounds a little bit like Love Unlimited Orchestra or something like it that. Reminds me a bit of that or. Um Kind of reminds me of some Pet Shop Boys stuff in a, in a strange way. There you go. Well, so Herb Alpert, you know, Rise by Herb Alpert. You know, and so, so we little by little, the idea of it being attached to the movie wasn't going to work, and we didn't know what we were going to do with it, but we kept sort of working on it. Uh, Stephen came up with this great sort of lazy rock guitar part that just kind of plays over top of it. Yoshimi does some screaming again uh, in, in, in the background and we actually had a trumpet player come in and play some trumpet at the end of it. So Which you have we a, doubled up with some keyboards. We did. It always has people a, have asked me about that sound. Yeah, got that it has a synthesizer horn. horn and a real horn both being played at the same time. And so, and it, we don't know why. We didn't know what we were going to do with this song and it always felt good at the very end of this thing as if it was the end of some big adventure. Some, like you could see the end of a movie where they went off in a balloon and everything worked out fine. And then the final chord of this of this uh, thing hints again at some doom just around the next corner, which which you know we can't wait for. So again, this is going to be the last song. I want to say thanks to everybody for coming out tonight. Thanks for everybody putting these things together, and I hope you enjoyed the record. And this doesn't mean that you have to buy it immediately in the store while you're there, but I'm sure your, your record store people who have put this on would appreciate it, if not ours. Any record, any good record that's out there would be fine. So thanks a bunch. Excellent. Thank you. <laughs>